welcome everyone to today's IGC event. Powering up energy investments in fragile states. I'm Jonathan Leap, Executive Director of the International Growth Center, the IGC. I'm delighted to welcome all of you. I understand we have 400 attendees registered from 59 countries, including representatives from nine different ministries in Togo, Guinea-Bissau, Timor-Leste, Netherlands, Denmark, Sierra Leone, Yemen, and Egypt. Welcome. Before we get started, let me review a couple of housekeeping items. We're going to have time at the end of the panel discussion to answer questions, so please type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens and make sure to include your full name and organizational affiliation. Please note that live translation for today's event is available in Arabic and French, and instructions on how to join an audio channel have been sent via the chat box. We are recording today's session, and the video and audio recording will be made available on the IGC's website. I'd also like to point out that there'll be a brief survey immediately following today's presentation, so please do take a minute to fill that out uh, later on so we can get your feedback. Please also feel uh, free to contribute to the online conversation using the hashtag energy for stability with the number four. Today's event builds on IGC's long-standing engagement in fragile states dating back to 2008. In 2017, the IGC initiated, initiated and hosted the Commission on State Fragility, Growth and Development, co-chaired uh, by uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron and Donald Kabaruka, former president of the African Development Bank. That commission culminated in the report Escaping the Fragility Trap. Coming out of that commission, the IGC established the Reducing State Fragilities Initiative and with it, the Council on State Fragility to bring greater focus and voice to the challenges facing fragile and conflict affected countries and to catalyze new thinking. Today, the IGC welcomes the opportunity to host this event, launching the call to action led by the Council on State Fragility and our valued partners in the G7 plus group of 20 conflict affected countries. Today's event launches a new global call to action on powering up energy investments in fragile states. The call is led by the Council on State Fragility, which is co-chaired by former UK Prime Minister David Cameron, former Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and former President of the African Development Bank, Donald Kabaruka, and is joint with the G7 Plus, an intergovernmental organization that advocates for new approaches to peace building and stability founded on national ownership. The G7 Plus is chaired by Sierra Leone, represented by His Excellency Minister Francis Kaikai, uh, present with us today. I'd now like to welcome Right Honourable David Cameron, former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and co-chair of the Council on State Fragility at the International Growth Centre. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and welcome, everyone. Um, my job today is to kick things off, which I'm uh, very enthusiastic about doing. I think this is the right initiative at the right time, powering energy investment in fragile states. Uh, I'm very proud to be a co-chair of the Council on State Fragility, and it's great to be joined by former President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf of, of Liberia, who co-chairs the Council with me, and Donald Kabaruka, um, who was head of the African Development Bank, as well as being the finance minister in Rwanda. And uh, I really enjoy working with this council. I think it's doing some very important and, and difficult work. Um, all I was going to say really is to answer the questions, what's the council? What's the initiative? Why now? And what is it that we need to happen before handing back to Jonathan, who's going to chair um, today's proceedings? The point about the council on state fragility is just to recognize that increasingly a larger and larger percentage of the world's poorest people are going to be stuck in fragile states where there's a combination of conflict and corruption and weak state capacity, lack of legitimacy, a whole set of often interrelated problems that holds those countries back. And the work I've done both as prime minister and since uh, helped a lot by the International Growth Center is looking at how we can best help these countries to help themselves. And it often means a rather different approach 
to what we've done in the past. I'm a huge enthusiast for aid and development, author of UK getting to 0.7. Desperately sorry that we're coming off 0.7. I think it's a bad decision, but I think aid and development can make a huge difference to our world and fragile states should, I think, be um, the focus. What's the initiative? Well, this call to action is recognizing that one of the key things that holds people back uh, in the poorest countries in our world is lack of an electricity connection. There are 800 million people without that connection and eight out of 10 of them, unsurprisingly, are in fragile states. And this initiative um, that as Jonathan said, is backed by the G7 plus by a whole range of prime ministers and presidents and NGOs and also bodies like the World Trade Organization is to say we need to sort this problem out and uh, now is the time to do it. It's actually an area of success, electricity connections. Over the last decade, another 400 million people have been connected. So we know it can be done, um, but we need a different focus. Well, why now? And I think this is the crucial point. Connecting up uh, people to decentralized green energy has always been desirable, but what's happened is that it's gone from a situation of being quite expensive and quite difficult to actually now being relatively cost-effective and relatively straightforward. The cost of solar energy has plummeted, the cost of other renewable energies has fallen, and the technology in terms of decentralized systems can be just as much as one solar panel, one battery, and the ability to have um, light and a place to charge your phone or cook your food or uh, run even a uh, refrigerator can make an enormous difference. So it is now possible um, for us to have these decentralized systems. They work better in fragile states because often the big energy projects can actually fuel conflicts rather than actually help to tackle um, poverty. So that's why we think, uh, why now? And I think there's an urgency because while a lot of money is spent on electricity and energy connections, only about 1% of it is spent on decentralized green systems. So that's why I think this call is the right issue, the right time, the right focus. Um, what are we asking finally for uh, to, to be done? Well, it's a call to action to the developed world and their aid budgets, a call to action to development finance institutions, a call to action to the World Bank and others, to donors, also to the private sector and to fragile states themselves. We want new financial mechanisms to make this more possible. We want the private sector to engage. We want fragile states themselves to make sure that they are welcoming and making possible these sorts of um, investments. And we want global institutions like the World Bank to get in and back this very important call for action. Uh, I think, as I said, it's the right issue at the right time. Of course, everything is overshadowed by COVID, which has caused the first increase in um, global poverty uh, for, for years, which is a huge tragedy. But as we build back and try to build back better, green energy, decentralized energy systems can be one of the best ways of connecting up those in our world who have no electricity connection. And that's why I think it's, as I said, the right issue at the right time, and I'm so proud to support it. Jonathan, back to you. Thanks very much, uh, David. Um, and as, as David says, today we'll be discussing these challenges. So both what is the role of expanding access to clean energy in the post-COVID-19 recovery and focusing particularly on mobilizing a global effort and global partnerships uh, to make this happen. I'll be putting a question or two to each of our panelists before we move on to the general discussion at the end and give you a chance to ask your questions. I'd like to welcome our four distinguished panelists here to tackle this changing, uh, challenging topic. The first is President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, former president of Liberia, who is co-chair of the IGC's Council on State Fragility. The second is Mayin Abdul Malik Said, who is the prime minister of Yemen. Uh, the third panelist is Francis Mustafa Kaikai, who is the minister of planning and economic development in Sierra Leone. And finally, Namita Vikas, who is the founder and managing partner at Octus ESG. Very pleased to have all of you uh, welcome. Let me turn first to uh, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who served as the 24th president of Liberia from 2006 to 2018, and was the first elected female head of state in Africa. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, as I mentioned, is co-chair of the Council on State Fragility at the International Growth Center. 
COVID-19 has triggered an unprecedented economic shock for countries affected by fragility, exacerbating existing vulnerabilities. As we know, fragility and energy poverty are closely interlinked. President Sirleaf, why is global leadership important in expanding energy access and enabling sustainable future growth in fragile states? And what role can international development institutions play in catalyzing these energy investments? Thank you, Jonathan. Let me say first how pleased I am to be a co-chair on the Council on State Fragility with former Prime Minister David Cameron, who just spoke, who is a champion of these Sustainable Development Goals, and former President of the African Development Bank, Donald Kabaruka, who authorized the breakthrough report on fragile states. Today, we note that COVID-19 has hit the world at a time when global leadership has lost its US pilot, paving the way for slides into nationalism, populism, isolationism, and presenting a major threat to democracy that had been largely institutionalized in a greater part of the world. At the same time, the pandemic has continued to highlight the deeply interconnected and interdependent nature of our world in trade, finance, travel, and communication technology. From climate change to nuclear proliferation, from social injustices and exclusions to gender inequalities and inequities, from ending poverty to ending the many senseless wars, the truth is that the presenting unfortunate global reality of this pandemic is a clarion call to come together, to work together to overcome our common global challenges. The truth also is that what affects all of us must involve all of us in its solution for all of us. None is safe until we all are safe. The call to action brings attention with urgency to global leadership, which is needed now to break the cycle of poverty and conflict, to provide the 800 million people residing in fragile states the opportunity of access to electricity at affordable cost using the huge potential for renewable energy made possible by technological advancement in promoting operations such as solar mining grades and mining hydros. I know that it works, but we have tried this in Liberia. And I know it works in other places and it brings to the needy, particularly in rural areas that have been neglected all of these years, the right to have safety in their homes through lights, to have more opportunities in their schools for distance learning, to bring to hospitals the kind of technology, technological advances that can enable doctors and paramedics to be more effective in their work, to bring to small businesses who are the vibrant members of society the opportunity 
for them to expand and to attempt to go to scale in their operations. International development institutions are well suited. In fact, it is their raison d'etre to take the lead, to mobilize collective action among governments, aid agencies, and the private sector. They have the technical capacity to identify the right financial mechanisms and risk mitigating measures that will enable the private sector to bring in private capital to make renewable energy operations possible in fragile states. At this time, with what we know COVID-19 has done to all of us, it is time for global leadership to join in collective action with international development finance institutions, governments, and all to be able to address these citizens, these people in states that have suffered from conflict, incapacity, the ability to be able to start anew, to have an opportunity to a better life. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'm looking forward to a great exchange among all the participants. Thanks, thanks very much, President Sirleaf. Let me turn now to Mayin Abdul-Malik Saeed, who is the Prime Minister of Yemen. Mr. Saeed has served as Prime Minister since October 2018, and previously served as a uh, Minister of Public Works and Roads in the, uh, from 2017, 2017 to 2018. The world's current largest humanitarian crisis is in Yemen. It's entering its seventh year with the human and economic costs of the ongoing conflict and of the COVID-19 pandemic crippling the country. Access to reliable electricity is just one of many basic necessities that people are often living without. Yemeni cities have very little access to public electricity and only two thirds of the poor had access to electricity when it was last formally measured in 2014, the lowest such rate in the Middle East. While Yemen's conflict has raged, businesses started importing solar panel systems and have in which have in recent years become much cheaper. And as the demand rose, the number of local importers and small retailers grew to the point where it's now quite common to see solar panels across city roofs. And by 2019, almost half of all Yemenis used solar power as their main source of lighting. Prime Minister Saeed, what are the key challenges and opportunities around expanding energy access in Yemen amid this ongoing conflict? Shukran, Jonathan. The topic that we have to refer to today is the topic that is the most important for the countries that are suffering from the conflict or from the countries that are suffering from the conflict. After Yemen now, after six years of the war, as I mentioned, هي الأزو... الأزمة الإنسانية <تصفيق> وهذا ما نواجهه في الحكومة بشكل كبير في عدد من القطاعات لكن يظل قطاع الطاقة والكهرباء هو القطاع الأكثر تضررا والذي يلمس المواطنون بشكل كبير ما ذكرتم من إحصاءات حول تحول الناس إلى أو إلى استخدام الطاقة البديلة أو يعني solar powers أو solar solar panels أو الطاقة الشمسية هو حدث بفعل انهيار منظومة التوليد الرئيسية هي كانت متواضعة في اليمن في حدود 1500 ميجا وات لبلد كبير في حدود 30 مليون نسمة لم تكن كافية بالطبع لقيادة نمو وخصوصا في قطاعات صناعية وقطاعات إنتاجية لكن على الأقل كانت تغذي المدن الرئيسية للبلاد انهيار هذه المنظومة أثر بشكل كبير 
لذلك كان من ضمن هذه التحديات كيف يمكن تحديد الأولويات بالنسبة لإدارة الحكومة أو إدارة هذا القطاع بشكل كبير لأنه تشكل علينا عبء كبير في مقابل خدمات مثل الصحة والتعليم وغيرها استخدام الطاقة الشمسية حتى نعرف بعض الأرقام في اليمن اليمن عندنا أكثر من 133 ألف تجمع سكاني في مختلف الأحجام بما فيها القرى والمستقرات الصغيرة مقارنة بدولة مثل مصر 100 مليون نسمة لكن لديهم بحدود 4 ألف تجمع سكاني هذا يوضح الفارق في تشتت التجمعات السكانية في اليمن والذي يضع عبء كبير على موضوع النقل والتوزيع فيما يتعلق بالطاقة الكهربائية لذلك استخدام الطاقة الشمسية في التجمعات الصغيرة في أيضا في المدن في التي في المرتفعات الجبلية التي لا تحتاج إلى طاقة كهربائية عالية لأنه يعني يكون عادة المناخ أفضل بكثير كانت الطاقة الشمسية أحد أهم العناصر التي ساهمت في توفير الطلب لذلك الأرقام تزايدت بشكل كبير وشهدت البلاد حتى بالنسبة لاستيراد ألواح الطاقة الشمسية طفرة كبيرة الذي ساهم في ذلك هي انخفاض كلفة هذه التكنولوجيا والتي ساعدت بشكل كبير على أنه كثير من من المواطنين في البيوت تستخدم هذه الطاقة لكن السؤال الأهم يأتي في دور الدولة والحكومات في ترتيب الشبكات الأصغر في إطار التجمعات السكانية استخدام التقنيات الجديدة فيما يتعلق بخزن الطاقة كلها أمور ممكن تساعد في إنارة كثير من القرى والمدن الصغيرة وأيضا فيما يتعلق بالمدارس المستشفيات وغيرها من القطاعات الحيوية خصوصا ونحن نعاني من يعني تداعيات جائحة كورونا والتي بدون طاقة كهربائية واتصالات لا يمكن بأي حال من الأحوال استخدام تقنيات معينة للتغلب على بعض مصاعب التعليم أو غيرها من التحديات الصعبة لذلك في اليمن كان التحدي الرئيسي خلال هذه الفترة أعتقد أنه ما نعانيه في اليمن هو ينطبق على كثير من الدول التي تعاني من الصراعات فيما يتعلق بصعوبة التمويلات فيما يتعلق بالقطاع الخاص أو فيما يتعلق بالجانب التشريعي والقانوني ضمان حق المستثمرين أشياء كثيرة نحاول أن كحكومة أن نمهد لها الطريق بحيث أن يكون هناك ضخ لهذه التمويلات في من القطاع الخاص فيما يتعلق بالاستثمار في قطاع الطاقة قدرة الدولة على الاستثمار ضعفت بشكل كبير جدا أصبح لدينا أحد الإشكاليات هو يعني في ظل هذه التحديات كيف يمكن الإنفاق الاستثمارات بشكل حكيم لكن لا يمكن للدولة الاستثمار في المشاريع الكبرى فيما يتعلق بالطاقة بالذات في أوقات الحروب وهذا الموضوع الذي يطرح عدد من البدائل التي يمكن للحكومة تدارسها مع يعني كثير من المنظمات وهذا هذه الندوة اليوم تتيح نقاش مثل هذه الأمور بما يساعد على توجيه الأنظار فيما يتعلق بتوجيه التمويلات للدول التي تعاني من هشاشة من الصراعات للاستثمار في هذا القطاع لأنه للتغلب على الأزمة الإنسانية علينا أن نستثمر وليس علينا أن نحجب هذه الاستثمارات لكن كيف نوجه هذه الاستثمارات؟ Thank you very much, um, uh, Prime Minister Shukran. Let me turn now to our third uh, panelist, uh, Francis Kaikai, who is Minister of Planning and Economic Development uh, in Sierra Leone. Uh, Minister Kaikai has many years of service, both at the national and international levels. He is chair of the G7 Plus and co-chair of the International Dialogue on Peacebuilding and State Building a tripartite platform of G7 plus donors and civil society. Fragile contexts are home to 460 million people living in extreme poverty in 2020, which is almost 90% of the worldwide total. Globally, in 2020, extreme poverty was expected to increase for the first time in more than two decades. 
In fragile contexts, 26 million more people were expected to fall into extreme poverty due to the pandemic and its socioeconomic impact in 2020. The energy needs of fragile and conflict affected situations are often much greater than non-fragile situations and constitute a constraint on society's ability to generate the economic growth and the political stability required to escape from fragility. Minister Kaikai, Kai, how can interventions seeking to increase the performance of the energy sector and improve energy access have the opportunity to unlock a fragile society's economic potential? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jonathan Lip. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, first of all, let me, on behalf of the G7 Plus group of countries, uh, thank the eminent members of the Council of State Fidelity for partnering with us to advance this noble cause. We also would like to extend our appreciation and thanks to all partners and dignitaries who have supported or signed up to our call to action on powering up energy investments in fragile states. I'm very pleased to state that the President of Sierra Leone, His Excellency Dr. Julius Madabio, fully supports this call to action. Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, decades of conflicts in different forms and the looming climate change in many fragile states have left behind the legacy of uh, in infrastructure, weak institutions, and weak economies, all of which are preconditions for economic and social well-being of our people. Access to sustainable and affordable sources of energy is an indispensable means to the revival of our economies and hence welfare of the people. This is a source of sustaining peace and stability. In many fragile and post-conflict settings, provision of affordable energy means investments in human capital development, economic diversification, and job creation for youths and women, all of which contributes to the peace dividend and continuous peace building. While there has been a steady growth in the global electrification rates, populations in fragile and conflict affected countries account for the big portion of people without electricity. In my own country, Sierra Leone, almost 75% of our population lack to electricity. Only 2% of the rural population has access to intermittent electricity. This is true for most of our fellow G7 plus member states. Public entities such as hospitals and schools are partially electrified. Imagine the millions of children going through basic education without access to the new technology that depends on the availability of electricity. Also ponder the difficulty of curbing crises of such serious as the COVID-19 pandemic, when health facilities, including some peripheral hospitals, are completely dark. Just ponder. Disruption in supply of electricity, or even lack of it, has often undermined state legitimacy. And trust in the state is critical for stability and peace. Despite our fragile peace and, peace and economies, G7 plus countries have a huge potential for growth and self-reliance. This includes untapped natural resources, young populations, and favorable climate for renewable energy. However, we are lagging behind on unleashing some potential that can spur value addition in agriculture, in promoting industrialization, economic growth, and hence stability. Lack of access to affordable energy is one of the main tools to transform our potential into a social and economic well-being of our people. Most of the countries are dependent on imported electricity, which is expensive 
of thermal energy, which is a big source of contamination of our environment in climate change. Innovation in renewable energy is a groundbreaking advancement with growing investments in solar energy and off-grid or mini-grid solutions. However, with huge concentrations of extreme poverty in our countries, uh, not many of the families can afford solar panels. They are being increasingly being made available, but increasingly they are also not affordable. On a macro scale, the high cost of electricity makes investments expensive and hence unattractive to many. Investments in cost-reducing technological solutions will be a way forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has enlightened us about the importance of digital connectivity in a globalized world and its dependence on the availability of reliable electricity. Therefore, as we embark on global recovery from the current COVID-19 pandemic and set on building back better, we need to invest to fill the gap in energy poverty in fragile countries that are among the farthest left behind so far in our global march to the sustainable development goals. Consequently, under this uh, joint call, I would like to uh, at least propose three issues as a way forward. One, for this call to action to serve as a compact among governments, the donor community, development partners, private sectors. And on behalf of G7 plus countries, I assure you of all our commitment to reforms that supports energy investments that can help in ensuring increased access to energy. We really hope Paul is a means to unleash the potential of energy in fragile countries. Together with the Council on Fragility, I commit this G7 plus efforts in realizing the aspirations of this call. Secondly, we call upon our development partners to increase the proportion of their assistance to the energy sector, and in particular in renewable sources with the aim of making these countries self-sufficient in energy. In particular, multilaterals or development finance institutions can help us in securing investment in the energy sector. With heavy reliance on foreign aid, assistance can be effective if targeted at the energy sector that impacts development outcomes in many other sectors and can guarantee self-reliance and stability in line with our country's priorities. Uh, finally, in order to fill the void in access to electricity and achieve the aspirations of uh, SDGs, we need to think of innovative facilities such as a global trust fund that can pool resources to fund electrification of the world's least developed nations, which includes the 20 G7 plus fragile and conflict affected countries. I would like to conclude by emphasizing uh, that however fragile the G7 countries are, they have inherited potential for stability and resilience. Unleashing that potential requires strong will and confidence at all levels in our globalized world, as well as a commitment to leave no one behind, including those impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll leave it there for now and thank you very much uh, for this session. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from other panelists, from members of the audience, and to also uh, proffer uh, ways forward in our discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Kaikai, and especially for those very sort of specific uh, issues that you've uh, put on the table and which I hope we can come back to uh, in the discussion. Um, I'd now like to introduce our final speaker on the panel, uh, Namita Vikas, who is the founder and managing partner at Octus uh, ESG. She's a global board member of the Climate Bonds Initiative in the UK. She introduced responsible banking to India and in the process raised over 1 billion US dollars in capital and credit lines towards mainstream green finance and issued India's first green bond in 2015. Getting financing right can have a significant impact in fragile contexts and support the transition from fragility to resilience. 
Yet fragile contexts face substantial funding gaps for delivering basic services for their citizens. And unique constraints in raising revenue, attracting private investment, and growing and diversifying their economies. Namito, how can the private sector play a leading role in driving this energy transition, especially in challenging contexts? And what support does it need from development players to mobilize sufficient finance and to manage the risks? while striking a balance between widening access to energy on the one hand and building in resilience. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to this important discussion. And I'm most honored to be in the midst of stalwarts uh, to discuss the role of private sector and the development players in accelerating energy access uh, within the fragile states. So if you look at uh, some of the uh, numbers that are put out there, uh, as far as the Paris Agreement and the SDGs are concerned, uh, the UN CTAG's uh, World Investment Report of 2014 estimated that out of the five to seven trillion dollars required for NM to finance uh, SDGs and the Paris Agreement, there would be an annual funding gap of $2.5 trillion for developing countries. However, the 2020 report states that developing countries have so far only received about a trillion and a half, uh, uh, I mean, a one and a half trillion dollars to date. That leaves almost about a hundred billion dollar financing gap uh, every year. And like we heard earlier on, that most of the finance that is flowing through to renewable energy is towards large scale utility, uh, commercial, industrial projects. And there is a very small, minuscule amount that is going towards energy transition from a decentralized uh, standpoint, mini grids, uh, green financial institutions that are out there. If you look at the challenges that are faced in terms of energy access and transition uh, from fragile states standpoint and uh, from private investors uh, perspective, inadequate production and transmission infrastructure, theft and safety of public goods, failure of bureaucracy to deliver on policies, gap between power and authority, which compromises the government's legitimacy for enforcing policies, inadequate tax processes, very high currency risks and uh, hedging costs, and of course the political risks, uh, insurance and risks of contractual breaches. And this is then coupled with the constraints faced by the private sector investors uh, which um, look at, uh, you know, economic tends to rank low on investment climate indicators, especially quality of infrastructure, market size, and institutional trust. As a result, the level of private investment in these countries remain low, even if the size of an economy or its geography characterizes, uh, characteristics are taken into consideration. So in case of energy solutions, private sector really lacks uh, the uh, patience and also the understanding about the risks of the returns in these geographies and inability to appropriately structure finance, risk mitigation me mechanisms often hinder uh, the capital flows into, uh, into these countries. And the landscape too, at many times when you look at decentralized energy is quite complex as investing uh, in these sectors require an aggregated approach of multiple stakeholders coming together. Uh, these are energy end users, energy providers, the companies that are delivering on energy, the ecosystem developers such as civil society, organizations, technology providers, system innovators, financiers, the local government. So all these have to play a role. And moreover, each stakeholder category has its own priorities. From ongoing payments for energy systems to capital for diversification for products to funding for capacity building, policy, regulatory arrangements, all this uh, falls as a very complex landscape that we're looking at here. So it is difficult, I wouldn't say impossible, therefore to channelize private capital towards um, these kind of projects, which demand a strong need for support from multiple quarters, aided by strong policy reforms and international capital flows that will facilitate the growth and stability. And the call for action is uh, absolutely in the position to do that where a systemic approach is uh, brought in uh, that involves governments, central banks, key local financial institutions, regulators, the DFIs, and uh, developmental players 
to work with investors and the financial sector representatives to prepare favorable policies that will look at harnessing and accelerating green transition, identify and locate capital for investing in low emissions and climate resilient development, provide assistance towards building capacities of local institutions towards attracting private capital for project development uh, and construction. And uh, this would then really uh, bring about, or the call for action can bring about a kind of a robust financial architecture that would then minimize the demand for increasingly scarce public capital, using it sparingly to de-risk projects and to mobilize private sector investments to the greatest degree possible. I think, you know, there are some very interesting de-risking examples where DFIs are playing uh, a key role, uh, providing a broad range of investments and advisory services that help address the market and institutional failures that limit private sector growth and impact. So for example, uh, in Kenya, a wind farm Lake Turkana was initiated by the, uh, the Dutch entrepreneurs, uh, uh, generating 310 megawatts capacity, adding almost 70% of capacity to the national grid of Kenya, which was backed by the African Development Bank uh, as a um, risk uh, taker uh, here. And this really enabled the close uh, of the viability gap and raise private capital. Similarly, we've seen FMO, the Dutch Development Bank, stepping in uh, to do a solar plant uh, in southern uh, Pakistan, uh, where the combination of low investment costs and high energy production has enabled such products to offer a very competitive energy tariff to the local and the marginalized uh, communities. Uh, further, we've also seen very some successful financing models in impact investing and blended finance supported for, by developmental finance and grants that provide support to energy access models to the poorer and remote communities. Uh, so within the fragile markets, the initial support from the governments, multilateral development banks like the World Bank and developmental agencies already existed. But research has shown that subsidies have shaped markets if designed appropriately for the local context, made available for an extended period with very clear timelines and plans for phase out, structured to avoid crowding in, uh, crowding out, I'm sorry, the private capital, and uh, uh, readily standardized for quality assurance and support beyond finance. So leveraging these kind of uh, mechanisms further, uh, it is important to assist policymakers and practitioners in the government to create an enabling environment to encourage public-private partnerships and revisit uh, uh, policies on subsidies, right? Like reallocation of fossil fuels and chemical agriculture towards uh, clean energy, sustainable farming. Uh, this would really be pragmatic and forward-thinking. Uh, the private sector is seen to be undertaking a variety of financial instruments uh, that go beyond traditional options of subsidies, debt, equity, grants. And uh, there are uh, uh, financial innovations uh, which are providing alternative financing instruments uh, which are linked to credit enhancements, guarantees, green bonds, blended finance, pay-as-you-go models. Uh, so, you know, with, uh, within the guarantee space, take the example of MEGA, uh, which is offering political risk insurance and credit enhancement guarantees towards uh, private sector uh, investor protection. And uh, very recently, their MEGA issued a, so 5.7 million USD um, guarantee to the Korea Land and Housing Corp Corporation uh, towards its equity investments to the Korea Myanmar Industrial Corporation Development Company for 15 years. And this really covers the risks that are around this project. And this project in turn is expected to support Myanmar's economic growth and industrial investment. So the point that I'm making here is that such guarantees are believed to not only help create stable market, but also get more and more of private players uh, with mainstream finance uh, coming in to contribute to the larger uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, we've seen you know, how grants and subsidized- yeah, yeah. could, could I ask you to wrap up? Because I'm keen that we save some time for questions. Yes. So, uh, so just a last point that I want to make here is that, you know, I think it is very, uh, very, very important that we leverage all this and provide some kind of replication, uh, which will look at you know enhancing the understanding of how the private sector can contribute to the uptake of energy transition in fragile states and building preparedness towards attracting investments. 
developing a common set of principles on fragile states approach to energy investments that could provide the private investors with a framework for operating in challenging environments and then working across governments local investors dfis to share the knowledge replicable models and develop some joint solutions and finally exploring and enhancing access to global funds uh, for countries to accelerate on their overall low carbon transition thank you right thanks very much uh, nimita i'd like to pick up first on on one of the ideas i think several of the panelists talked about president surly if i think be, uh, beginning but echoes through the other ones and then nimita bringing a private sector perspective and that is the challenge of collective action and I wonder, um, President Sirleaf, perhaps if we could begin with you, is how can the international community um, bring uh, to the table sort of uh, interventions, solutions that help to address this collective action problem? And I guess I'm thinking broadly both across international and, and bilateral donors, uh, potentially private NGOs uh, uh, and other donors, and of course, ultimately the private sector. And I just wonder if I could ask you first, you and then Minister Kai Kai, I wonder if I could ask you the same question. So what are the, the things that the international institutions in particular uh, can do to help address that collective action problem? Oh, um, you're on mute, uh, President Sarif. Um, International development finance institutions must take the lead. Institutions such as the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank and others must take the lead. And I can't see any other institution than the World Bank which provides support to all the fragile countries, should bring together in a round table all of the players, whether they're governments, you know, the pri uh, bringing private sector, uh, bringing together um, aid agencies, must all come together and take the commit itself that this is an important priority and then find a means whereby they can develop the programs to be able to deliver this. Some of the things that I mentioned about uh, guarantees and subsidies and risk mitigating uh, instruments are things that they would bring together in a discussion to be able to come up with viable programs. It's only the convener has to be a large international development finance institution. Thank you very much. Mr. Kai Kai. Um, yeah, taking the, yeah, thank you very much. Taking, I think it's an important, it's an important question. And, uh, and from the experience uh, here in Sierra Leone, it's very clear that uh, government has a big role to play uh, in each country in uh, bringing together these uh, uh, international partners, you know, to address uh, this very important issue uh, that we are discussing here. And, um, you know, the development financial, financial institutions, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, bilateral ones as well, because many of them are playing key roles, uh, the private sector, I think increasingly we see them really converging on around this issue of energy and with government playing a key role. So in the fragile states, it's important that uh, the governments um, are able to bring together these key players around the table to discuss this important issue um, on how to uh, move the agenda forward. Uh, because, uh, you know, we have the, the uh, you know, we, the, the national grid is there. It has a lot of challenges in our countries and, um, you know, it serves mainly the urban population. Um, but increasingly, we have a larger number of people living in rural areas, and this is where um, we need to direct attention. And um, in the case of Sierra Leone, we have a national development plan, a medium-term plan, and energy is a key sector within that. Um, and energy has been identified as a binding constraint. So it's a question of how to bring these players to understand 
the constraints posed by energy. And I think increasingly everybody realizes that. So coming around it, I think is important. And, and to ensure that, uh, you know, whatever investments that go into this sector are protected, uh, in many ways, government has to make sure the reforms are there that are convincing to these partners that come around together and the, that these uh, reforms are actually protecting investments um, and so on. So, so government's role is key in all of this. And I think uh, that, that's, that I think is, is one of the things. And also, there's the issue of the debt consolidation. You know, one of the problems we have is uh, subsidizing electricity so much, especially for the urban population. Uh, it's uh, huge, eating a huge chunk into the national budget. You know, we cannot continue this without real reform uh, in that sector. Um, again, there is agreement with uh, development partners who are supporting uh, various aspects of our development work. That these are things we need to do to make sure we can unlock the potential that we think energy has. And, uh, and then to agree also to move from the national grid to these mini grids, the off-grid uh, alternatives are provided by the new technology in this sector. You know, and doing this collectively, I think is a way forward and the best way forward, uh, in my opinion. I mean, with government playing a critical role in our fragile states. Right. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And I think you, you opened there, you're, particularly your mentioning of the debt issue, opened the second big issue here, which is uh, financing. Uh, and I think both the role of financing um, from uh, public sources, international institutions, but also private financing. Uh, Namita, this is something you've touched on, but I'd like first to go, if I could, to Prime Minister Saeed. And I wonder, uh, Prime Minister, if, if you could offer some observations about how can we mobilize additional public and private financing to address uh, this, this need? And then, Namita, I'll come to you for, for your, what you think are the two or three key points. يمكن ناميتا تحدثت عن المواضيع المتعلقة بالقطاع الخاص فيما يتعلق بالإشكاليات المتعلقة بالتمويل لكن الوضع يتعلق بأنه دائما القطاع الخاص يبحث عن ضمانات أو عن عدد من القيم لتقليل المخاطر وهذه أحد أهم الإشكاليات الآن ما هي الوسائل التي يمكن أن توفر القطاع الخاص آلية للدخول؟ بالنسبة لنا كحكومة يمكن بدأنا الآن في إنزال مناقصات هي هي الأول هي الأولى في اليمن فيما يتعلق بشبكات صغيرة من الطاقة للمدن الصغيرة هي الأولى في اليمن لسنوات وكان هذا الموضوع غير شائع في اليمن للمدن الصغيرة إنه أوجد إنه كلفة التوليد عالية فيما يتعلق بالمحطات التقليدية. في تتكلم يعني في حدود من 10 إلى 20 إلى 30 مية هذه ستكون بادرة أولى لكن الكلفة ما تزال عالية بالنسبة للمنطقة دول زي مصر قطعت شوط كبير جدا فيما يتعلق بالاستثمارات في الطاقة الشمسية المملكة العربية السعودية كسروا حاجز 3 سنت كيلو وات الضمانات في هذه الدول كبيرة في الدول التي تعاني من الصراعات مثل اليمن ما زالت يعني حتى لو نزلت هذه المناقصات بدون أي ضمانات للاستثمارين ستكون التعرفة عالية بالمعنى أنه لن أصد وكما ذكر وزير التخطيط في سير اليوم أنه سيكون هنا نحن الآن مخططا لا يكون هناك دعم للطاقة فستكون الكلفة التي يدفعها المواطن في دولة ضعيفة الاقتصاد أو تعاني من مشاكل اقتصادية مثل اليمن ونعلم أنه الطاقة والاتصالات هي الأساس الذي يمكن بناء السلام في في المجتمعات الهشة إذا كانت هذه الكلفة عالية ولا يمكن إذا وبالذات إذا كانت هذه الاستثمارات المفترض أن قيمة التعرفة المحصلة تغطي على الأقل أو بدعم بسيط من الدولة هنا علينا أن نناقش موضوع الدعم والذي لا تستطيع أن توفر حكومات تعاني من صراعات ففيما يتعلق بالتمويلات القطاع الخاص في دور على الحكومة فيما يتعلق بالتشريعات ضمانات من الناحية القانونية لكن فيما يتعلق بالضمانات المالية للتمويل هذا في هذا الموضوع نحتاج إلى مؤسسات تمويل دولية أن تساعد في هذا الموضوع ونحن في 
فعلنا الان عدد من القطاعات لمجلس الطاقه بعض القطاعات لتنظيم الطاقه في اليمن بحيث انها تعمل بشكل موازي لدراسه احدث التشريعات والتنظيمات في المنطقه وفي العالم اذا كان هناك دعم من هذه المؤسسات للدول الهاشه سيساعد ذلك بشكل كبير في تطوير انظمه الشراكه مع القطاع الخاص في موضوع دراسه موضوع الضمانات هل هو الموضوع ضمانات بالمعنى المفتوح ام موضوع تقاسم الارباح او تقليل من الكلفه بحيث تصبح الكلفه المولده من الطاقه لهذه الشبكات او الميني جريدز قابله لل يعني او تكون مقبوله بالنسبه للسكان بحيث تكون تجارب ناجحه فبدانا ذلك في عدد من المدن الصغيره وسنقيس ذلك خلال الفتره القادمه، هذا دور الحكومه لكن فيما يتعلق باعطاء الضمانات حتى نصل الى نسب يعني او كلفه يعني معقوله للطاقه الكهربائيه هذا الموضوع يحتاج الى شراكه المؤسسات الدوليه في التمويل. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Namita, if you'll excuse me, I think we should move to the whole question and answer session now because we're, we're um, at risk of squeezing that too much. Uh, but there, is a, there are some questions that uh, I want to come back to you on uh, that have come from the audience. The, um, let me start with a question uh, that was asked of all uh, panelists uh, by Musa Soko, which is how do we power up energy investments when social accountability is a major challenge? in fragile settings. And then let me ask a second question as well, and then I'll give uh, anyone uh, on the panel who wishes to comment a chance to do so. And this question was actually directed to you, Namita, and that is, how would you challenge short-termism? This is a question, I'm sorry, from Russell Gajar. And he says, how would you challenge short-termism, uh, which seems to be a deeply entrenched part of corporate behavior? And how do you uh, also uh, help uh, investors to challenge that short-termism? So a question about short-termism uh, for you, and actually maybe we start with you, and then if I could go to the panel generally is the, the, the question before, how do we power up energy investments when social accountability is a major challenge in fragile settings? So first to you, Namita. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I think, you know, uh, it is the investor's mindset uh, as far as short termism is concerned. And, you know, it's a it's a it's a nature of the uh, nature of the financial instruments when are being invested in these sectors and it's a demand and supply kind of a scenario. Right. So investors uh, demand the asset owners are demanding high returns in short time and therefore asset managers are comply compile uh, compelled to look at short termism so i think we need to look at uh, we look at we need to look at more of patient capital uh, for example there are large pension funds across the world uh, which have tenors of 10 to 15 years horizon and we are also seeing that in terms of uh, green bond issuances where uh, the tenors are upwards of 10 to 15 years i think for transitions uh, as far as energy is concerned into stay into developing markets we need to uh, tap into those uh, investments that are looking at long term uh, stability and long term returns of the investment and we are seeing more and more um, international trend where uh, finance is moving uh, in that direction and the other thing that I want to just uh, point out here is from an investor lens and which is linked to uh, also, you know, guarantees and, uh, um, you know, how do we make the capital move? I think it is all about uh, what are the kind of um, opportunities that are available. So, for example, the Green Climate Fund uh, is out there, which is uh, ready to plow in an amount of capital if there is a larger capital that is coming into as a bundle, right? So we need to really look at these kind of facilities and explore these kind of facilities. And I believe that there is a huge opportunity to work in this space, to get in the World Bank and the right kind of institutions to look at how finance uh, can move and uh, short-termism short can be challenged or addressed. Right. Thanks very much, Namita. Uh, Minister Kaika, I wonder if I could come first to you and then to President Sirleaf on this other question, which is how do we power up energy investments when social accountability is a major challenge in fragile contexts? Yeah, I think um, I, I, I thank you very much for that question. I think it's a very important question. And um, it's, a, it's this is a challenge that, of governance that uh, you know, we all face uh, in fragile, fragile states. 
uh, there is increasing demand for power, uh, both in urban and rural areas. And, uh, and we have limited resources um, to really uh, meet the growing demand you know, for, for energy. And, uh, and most times, you know, we also have politics also around these issues. So it's a question of uh, a policy. How do you make sure that uh, you have an energy policy that's really, uh, you know, puts premium on where premium is really due? And um, the, uh, the urban population, they often have uh, the priority because uh, there is growing demand there and they are more vocal, more vociferous. And in a political context, they have all the advantages and so on. And if you invest all the resources you have in the urban areas, what happens to people in the, in the, in the, in the rural areas uh, who are in most of our countries in the majority as well? And they are also uh, demanding on government uh, power and other uh, social services and so on. So it's a challenge. And uh, I'm not saying it's very easy, uh, but these are things that, uh, you know, good governance measures have to really address. Um, how do we uh, make sure that we, we minimize wastages? How do we uh, minimize uh, thefts of power, um, especially in the urban areas, and make sure we have enough resources to also uh, support the rural areas? Um, these are the challenges which governments face. And, uh, and I'm, I cannot really tell you it's very easy. Uh, I'm also in governance. I can see them and uh, I see how challenged our president is because he goes around the country and talks to people and I know the request they are making of him and so on. And in the context of limited resources, uh, this is a real challenge. Uh, and yet, you know, we have to account to the people, yes. And they all need power, yes. But can you provide for all of them? No, so how do you do it? And that's why this call to action is very important um, to see how government can work with development partners, you know, to come together and resolve, you know, some of these huge challenges that we face, you know, and uh, our heads of states, our presidents uh, clearly have huge challenges out there. And, uh, they, you know, to meet this is not very easy. And, uh, and sometimes they walk a very tight rope. And also it's a question of, I mean, how do you um, also make sure that uh, you maintain your, your power base you maintain your legitimacy as a government, and to make sure also you are able to meet the needs of the most vulnerable in your, in your, in your, in your country. I mean, who reside also in the urban areas and also in the rural areas. So it's a very challenging issue. And um, I mean, one cannot shy away from it, but these are really, these are really tough questions. And um, I, there is no one size fits all. Uh, countries differ, uh, but clearly, uh, meeting this challenge of power for the people um, is not going to be easy. And that's why we need this uh, call. And we need to bring many, many players on board, you know, to be able to meet this growing demand. And I'm very happy that, uh, you know, we are talking about how the private sector can come in uh, to help even in running utility companies in urban areas to make sure they prevent losses and thefts and so on and also to bring private sector into providing uh, renewable energy, uh, tapping into renewable energy sources to provide main grid services and so on in growing towns in the, in the, in the rural areas. Um, so I think uh, there are clearly opportunities there for uh, collaboration, for coordination, and uh, this call to action, I hope will help, you know, to open up uh, the space, you know, for more players to come to address the energy issue. Right. Thanks very Thank much, you. Minister. Uh, President Sirleaf. Uh, government must take the lead, must provide the leadership in explaining to the people, to civil society, what the agenda is, what their priorities are, how achievable are the goals, the benefits and the responsibilities by civil society for implementing the goals that the government has set in the area of energy. Clearly, it will take a lot to be realistic and to be truthful about what can be achieved in what period of time, what will require the support of partners to be able to <clears throat> achieve 
that. And this is not just presenting these initially in explaining the agenda, but monitoring what happens as consultations are brought together so they are kept in form of the role the government will be playing. The role will be played by development partners in being able to carry out the agenda that has been established with respect to energy. To reach the rural areas is a challenge uh, because the infrastructure constraints are going to mean you can't get it to everybody at the same time. So being able again to provide a clear, truthful explanation to the public and to give them an opportunity uh, to be able to partake in dialogue regarding the implementation of the agenda can enhance uh, the social accountability as you move ahead with an energy program that focuses mainly on the marginalized. Thanks very much, uh, President Sirleaf. Uh, Mr. Uh, Syed, I wonder if I could uh, come to you. There's actually three questions uh, from the audience that have been addressed to you. Uh, and let me say all three of them and then just invite you to comment uh, on the points raised. The first is from uh, Lainey Nimmo, who's from the Conflict and Environment Observatory. And she has asked, as large scale solar projects are being rolled out in the agricultural sector and more individual farmers are turning to the technology, is anything being done to prevent unsustainable extraction of groundwater? So that's the first question, the link between solar projects and the extraction of groundwater. The second question is from Abir Al-Iranli, who is a PhD student from Yemen at the University of Sussex. And his question is, what role does the private and electricity providers uh, play in the future of electricity system, the electricity system in Yemen? And what is their role in the current war economy? And then the final question is from uh, Vanek Chun, a PhD and president of the International Institute for Scientific Research. And the question is how to ensure energy access inclusiveness from the digitization um, for the distribution to have nots during the COVID and the post COVID period in Yemen. So I think really a distributional question about how we make energy access inclusive. Um, الأسئلة <تصفيق> وهذا تسبب بالفعل باستنزاف لأنه لا يوجد أطر رقابية في المستوى السلطات المحلية على استخدام مضخات المياه بالطاقة الشمسية وهي أحد المخاطر في بلد مهدد بالأمن المائي في مثل اليمن الآن ما نقوم به بحيث لا يكون هناك تدهور كبير في هذا الموضوع هو العمل على مستوى أيضا السلطات المحلية حتى يكون لها وموضوع استخدام الطاقة الشمسية في يعني أحد النقاط اللي مهم قبل أن ندخل للسؤال الثاني والثالث دور المجتمعات المحلية نحتاج إلى تقييم حقيقي في كل الدول التي تعاني من صراعات في اليمن لدينا دور للسلطات المحلية حافظة بشكل كبير في أثناء فترات الصراع على دور معين لكن التخطيط فيما يتعلق بالطاقة يحتاج إلى أنه بعض الأحيان قد تقود السلطات المحلية وسائل أو بعض الأفكار التي قد لا تكون مناسبة وتوت يعني تشكل أعباء فيما يتعلق بالشبكة العامة هذا هذا الموضوع أيضا أحد النقاط التي يمكن نقاش فيما يتعلق بتقييم للواقع فيما يتعلق باستخدام الطاقة البديلة سؤال الثاني والثالث يمكن سؤال الثاني فيما يتعلق بدور القطاع الخاص في اليمن ما زال دور القطاع الخاص في الطاقة هي في استثمارات قصيرة الأمد بتكلفة عالية ووقود عالي التكلفة وهذا أحد أهم التحديات الآن 
كيف ممكن أن ما ينفقه اليمنيون الآن بشكل متفرق على الواحة الطاقة الشمسية اللي بعضها قد لا يكون ذو كفاءة عالية أو هذه قد نقول مئات الملايين من الدولارات سنويا ينفقها المواطنون لشراء الواحة الطاقة الشمسية لكن فيما يتعلق باستثمارات حقيقية طويلة الأمد وهنا نأتي الموضوع كيف يمكن ترتيب دور القطاع الخاص في استثمارات متوسطة وطويلة في يعني بالذات في بلد مثل اليمن هناك نوعا ما عدم ثقة من القطاع الخاص فيما يتعلق بالاستثمارات طويلة الأمد وهذا الموضوع يمكن تحدثنا فيما يتعلق ترتيب التمويلات أو أنه يكون في شراكة من مؤسسات التمويل الدولية مع القطاع الخاص بحيث يكون هناك نوع من دعم أو تشجيع للقطاع الخاص في اليمن للعمل في قطاعات الطاقة إلى الآن يمكن الآن ما نطرحه في محطات التي نخطط لها والتي بدأت وثائقها الآن بالاكتمال وستنزل في مناقصات فيما يتعلق ب للمدن الصغيرة فيما يتعلق يعني محطات طويلة الأمد بالطاقة الشمسية هي أحد الوسائل لإدخال القطاع الخاص في الطاقة لكن كانت الدولة قبل الحرب هي نقول هي التي تحت أو متولية موضوع توليد الطاقة وكان في أعباء كبيرة كان هناك دعم كبير هذه المنهجية ستختلف خلال الأعوام القادمة سيكون في دور أكبر للقطاع الخاص بالذات في قطاع التوليد ويمكن في قطاع التوزيع في قطاع النقل يعني محتاج إلى استثمارات كبيرة لكن الآن فكرة أو استخدام التكنولوجيا وهنا علينا أن نقيم الموضوع بشكل واقعي ما هي كيف يمكن استخدام من بشكل واقعي من التكنولوجيا التي تناسب أو بعد تقييم حقيقي للمخاطر وتقييم حقيقي للواقع في الدول الهشة كيف يمكن استخدام ذلك فيما يتعلق بوصولية الناس الكهرباء أو كيف يعني التفكير في وصول في بلد زي اليمن اللي هو يمكن ثلثين من المواطنين اللي كان يصل لهم الطاقة الكهربية توقف وصول الطاقة الكهربية اللي كانت تصل عبر الشبكات مدن شهدت نزاعات مختلفة مدن كان فيها نازحين مثلا يعني عدد سكان فيها لا يتجاوز ال 100,000 ثم فجاه قفز الى مليون ونص مليون نسمه مليونين نسمه معظمهم من النازحين. البنى التحتيه في هذه المدينه كشبكات ومرافق كانت لا غير مصممه لهذا العدد من السكان. فكيفيه وصول او تعزيز وصول الناس الى الطاقه الكهربائيه باعتبارها اساس للتنميه، اساس ل من مقاييس الحضاره بالذات في المناطق الحضريه في يعني يحتاج الى ترتيب ترتيب الاولويات فيما يتعلق بالاستثمار في قطاع الطاقه البديله ويمكن كان احد الافكار ان يكون استثمار الحكومه في المرحله القادمه بالشراكه مع القطاع الخاص في موضوع الميني جريدز او الشبكات المصغره في المدن والتجمعات السكانيه لانه الربط في بلد كبير زي اليمن حدود 500 الف كيلو متر مربع سكان منتشرون في اماكن كثيره من الصعب بناء شبكات والاعتماد على التوليد التقليدي بمحطات ذات استثمارات كبيره فممكن اللي يساعد في الفتره القادمه شراكه القطاع الخاص وموضوع الشبكات المصغره في المدن والتجمعات السكانيه. عوده اليك جوناثان. Shukran. Thanks very much, uh, Prime Minister. Oh, we have time just for one more question, and I would ask, um, I'll come uh, to you, Namita, and to Minister uh, Kai Kai. If I could ask if you could just put your answers into just 30 seconds, uh, so, so key, key points. The final question is from Jeffrey Fine uh, from Canada. Uh, welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you with us, uh, who asks, a major problem is the lack of bankable projects that can attract private investors, whether that's domestic or international. And the question is, how can governments address this problem? So if I could just come to you for just quick thoughts, uh, first Namita and then Minister Kai Kai. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, bankability uh, can be addressed through credit enhancements and uh, coming back to blended finance and uh, guarantees. I think these are some of the measures that can address bankability of certain projects. And uh, that is how financiers are able to uh, flow through capital. So, uh, so my quick response is that, you know, blending of finance is a good way to attract capital, which is on the back of a guarantee a credit enhancement or a grant. And uh, therefore the credit rating of that particular 
um, project goes up, therefore a private investor uh, may take interest in that investment in states like this. Thank you. Thanks, Namita. Uh, Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important uh, question. And, uh, you know, on bankable projects, uh, I think we, we do realize that uh, we need bankable projects in this sector in order to avoid private finance. And therefore, uh, we have gone ahead to institute uh, public private partnerships, you know, in this particular sector. And we see that already working um, in many, many sectors. And uh, with the support of the, uh, the, the UK, for example, uh, we have, uh, you know, private sector coming in to actually deliver on mini grids in many growing villages now in Sierra Leone. And uh, I mean, there is a commitment to that. And I know we have more coming because uh, we have small, nice projects that are really focused on delivering this to the, to the people. So uh, yes, people projects are important. And, uh, and increasingly we are having more and more of them uh, through public-private partnership. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Minister. Well, I want to move now towards summing up and I, I'll start myself with just offering a few points that I think have come out uh, today and are clearly important. And then I'd like to come to each of the panelists and again to ask you in about 40 seconds <laughs> to summarize what you think um, are the sort of three key changes or improvements that would contribute to expanding Please the access in fragile states. So what would be the top of your hit list? Uh, and I'll ask each of the four of you uh, on that. What would be most important for contributing to energy access in, uh, in fragile states? So let me um, just offer a few uh, points uh, before we get into there that I think have come out um, strongly across the presentations. I think the first is uh, just to bear in mind the, the sort, of, sort of benefits and importance of what we're talking about, that energy access has catalytic potential for broad social and economic gains. Uh, we've heard uh, uh, almost all of the speakers talk about how it can facilitate um, uh, learning and education, how it can stimulate job creation and new business, how it can support the health sector and the improvements in delivery of health care, um, how it can improve uh, communication and consultation and accountability. So there's no question but that energy access has this very strong potential to achieve uh, peace, uh, contribute to peace and stability. Without energy, fragile countries will be left even further behind as the world recovers from COVID. The second is that the G7 plus member states and other fragile countries have the potential to escape fragility and, and to help their people recover from COVID-19 and to prosper. And so we have the best possible partners in this exercise that we have a group of countries who are committed to, uh, to this agenda of, of transitioning out of fragility to escaping the fragility uh, trap and who recognize the crucial role of energy access in contributing to prosperity and to peace and to uh, stability and resilience. The third element, as, as David Cameron really highlighted for us right from the very beginning, is that the solutions are in front of our eyes, that the costs of off-grid renewable solutions have come down significantly. But at the same time, we need to recognize that they remain too expensive for poor households in the absence of donor support. So targeted aid funding to support energy investments, joint private public initiatives, as Mr. Kai Kai was mentioning, um, to leverage private capital will all be important in terms of scaling uh, access to energy in these challenging environments. I think as Namita has reminded us, we need to also think about other forms of, of risk mitigation and credit enhancement to guarantees and MEGA uh, playing an important role. I think very importantly there to be thinking about longer term commitments as essential to securing the kind of private sector investment and participation that we'll need to support uh, energy access going forward. I think as, as President Surleaf really eloquently reminded us, at the heart of driving this forward will be global leadership, um, that the international development organizations have a central role to play in bringing together donors, governments, uh, and the private sector, uh, both to secure 
uh, the appropriate priorities around the allocation of aid resources, but also to develop the finance mechanisms that can unlock investment at scale and unlock the pension funds, as Namita was uh, mentioning. As Mr. Kaikai uh, emphasized, the role of governments in fragile states is central. Uh, it rests with them to create the enabling environments we need for investment, uh, including uh, the public-private partnerships, and to developing the national strategies and frameworks that set out the priorities uh, for, uh, for their, their energy access agenda. And as President Sirleaf uh, reminded us, that consultation and communication hugely important as part of uh, delivering all of that, making clear the priorities um, uh, that the government is pursuing. And that relates to the fact that governments will face hard choices and there will be hard decisions about how you deploy limited resources. So collaborations are needed to ensure that we can leverage the limited public finance that's available, but communication is essential and consultation is essential in terms of ensuring both the accountability that will be necessary going forward for these uh, to be effective. So let me stop uh, there and now invite our panelists if they can just identify for us two or three things that they think are most important in this area. And I'll go just in the order in which uh, the speakers spoke. So I'll begin, if I may, with you, President Sarif. Thank you. Let me first commend uh, Minister Kaikai and Sarah Yoon for the reported progress uh, in this regard. Now to the three changes. Uh, first, government must set the priorities on renewable energy. Second, development partners must align their programs with the government agenda. And third, something I said before, civil society and the people must be a part of the dialogue to understand the priorities and know their role and responsibility in implementation. Great, thanks very much. Um, uh, Prime Minister uh, Said. هناك عدة نقاط النقطة الأولى العمل على توليد الطاقة بشكل غير مركزي لتسهيل وصولها توصل الطاقة إلى المواطنين بطريقة بدون فاقد بشكل كبير ويعني بالذات في الدول التي فيها صراع يعني هذا أحد أهم النقاط. النقطة الثانية التعامل مع المجتمع الدولي على تطوير الأدوات المالية للتمويل أو الضمانات أو قبض المخاطر يعني أساليب التمويل فيما يتعلق النقاش مع المانحين للدعم للاستثمارات في هذا القطاع أو في قطاع الطاقة في الدول التي تعاني من الانتشاش أو الصراع النقطة الثالثة تتعلق باستخدام التكنولوجيا لتحسين مستوى تقييم المخاطر وعدم تضخيمها بالذات في المناطق التي تعاني من الصراعات ممكن أضيف نقطة رابعة أيضا فيما يتعلق التفاوض مع المانحين لتخصيص جزء من التعهدات الإنسان من التعهدات في دول الصراعات لتكون تعهدات تنموية وليست بمجملها تعهدات إنسانية هذا الموضوع يمكن في اليمن لخمسة أو ست سنوات هناك مؤتمر للتعهدات الإنسانية في واحد مارس سيكون هناك مؤتمر كبير لتعهدات المانحين في اليمن خلال أيام لكن من المهم النقاش مع المانحين أن يكون هناك جزء من هذه التمويلات تذهب في إطار تنموي وبالذات في إطار Renewable Energy أو الطاقة المتجددة التي تساعد في تنمية في المجتمعات وتساعد في إحلال السلام وصول الطاقة للتجمعات السكان مساعدتهم على التعليم والصحة وغيرها هي أحد أسس الاستقرار هذه أربع نقاط وليس الثلاثة Shukran, thanks, Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Kaikai, I wonder if I could ask you, just in summary, if you could give a, a very quick example of a model that has worked in Sierra Leone. So you mentioned collaboration on, uh, uh, I think it was with the UK, uh, but if there's just a specific example, you say, you know, where we've had an upfront contribution and, and commitment by a donor that working with us had made this happen. Oh, you're on mute, Minister. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. 
Uh, let me first of all thank uh, uh, President Joseph. I served in Liberia during your tenure. Uh, I was with the UN, and uh, I'm very pleased to meet you today. And I'm happy you you also acknowledge my views. Um, but on the on the key points, um, I want to emphasize uh, the fact that uh, decentralized energy systems uh, should be the way forward. I think the majority of our people who live in rural areas, and we must unlock the potential in those rural areas, you know, to support our, our economy. Secondly, um, as uh, President Salif said, the role of government is critical here. And uh, I, I mean, you cannot overemphasize that uh, because government has to play a central role in the delivery of this important service to our people. Government has to play a role in strengthening institutions um, especially institutions that manage this sector. And also, you know, government has to have a very clear medium to long-term plan, you know, to which everyone subscribes and which the people have to know about, including civil society, as right pointed out earlier. The, sec the third area for me is a partnership with uh, development, uh, uh, with our development uh, partners, donors. I think a lot of them are keen. They've been part of our story for a very long period. Uh, they've seen up, ups and downs in these countries. Uh, some have been there before wars and after wars, they've still been there. Poverty is increasing, they are there, they are part of this. So we must come together and have a compact to look ahead together, you know, as partners, seriously, collectively. And, uh, and that leads me to the example you want me to give. Um, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, the, the UK, uh, the former DFID, they have been in Sierra Leone for a very long period. And right now, they are working with the government, I mean, to make sure that it can provide uh, mini grid facilities to at least 90 settlements across Sierra Leone. And, uh, and they are doing this together with government's contribution and, uh, and also bringing in uh, private partners um, to work with uh, uh, UNOPS, you know, to provide these services and also even to manage those services, you know, the private sector to manage these services um, of the people and so on. Um, I see this as a very concrete example and one that I believe will help to transform many, many lives in rural Sierra Leone. Uh, and I think uh, we are grateful for that support and I hope uh, we'll have other partners coming forward to support the government, the government's agenda in this particular area. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Minister. And Namita, uh, uh, over to you, and please uh, be quick. Yes, I know. Uh, so, uh, you know, given that we are in the stage of COVID recovery and economic recovery, I think uh, the most important thing would be to create a kind of an international coalition for global, global and local cooperation with a call for action as a part of, uh, you know, three things that can be looked at. First, at a policy level, how can fragile states work towards favorable policies for attracting more and more capital domestically as well as internationally into the countries? Uh, second, measures to unlock uh, the capital uh, with a very specific target. So for example, either create a fund for fragile uh, countries to tap into or create a separate facility with the Green Climate Fund to look at um, plowing in and unlocking uh, that capital with very, very targeted geographies and the third most important is exploiting the replicability we've seen the fintech boom in some of the markets in um, africa which has uh, given access to the local uh, poorest of poor communities uh, uh, the decentralized energy access on very small payments i think these uh, kind of models need to be replicated and this kind of a global coalition with multiple stakeholders i uh, i think would be able to bring about uh, the ca required capital and the change that we want to see thank you Great. Thanks very much, uh, Namita. Um, well, I want just to, to close with first a huge thank you to all of our, our speakers, uh, including uh, former Prime Minister David Cameron at the beginning and, and our four very distinguished panelists. Uh, very uh, insightful and I think provocative uh, discussion and, and a deep vote of thanks to all of you, which I'm sure is on behalf of the audience. I also want to thank the audience. Uh, as you know, we have the uh, Zoom audience, but we also have an audience uh, live on Facebook and just want to thank all of you uh, for having joined us. Um, 
If possible, one final uh, request, please do fill out the survey that you get, the feedback survey, really helpful for us in terms of understanding uh, what works best uh, for these sorts of events. But a pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, thanks particularly to our speakers for all the insights that you brought uh, to our discussion today. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Mm -hmm.